Hello, my name is Mark Sign, the minister of the Northfield Church of Christ in Northfield, New Jersey. I would like to take this opportunity to welcome you to our evening services for Sunday, April the 28th. Uh, per usual, we will sing some songs of praise to the Lord. We will observe the Lord's Supper. And I have a message that I hope will uh, uplift all of us. Here at Northfield, we sing from the songbook, Songs of Faith and Praise. Uh, you may not have that book, so I'll make sure to give you the number in our book and the title so you have time if you want to sing along to either Google the song or if you have a songbook, you can find the song yourselves. The first song that we're going to sing in our book is number 731. The title is Take Time to Be Holy. Take Time to Be Holy. 731. Take time to be holy, speak up with the Lord, abide in Him always, and feed on His Word. Make friends of God's children, help those who are weak, Forgetting in nothing is blessings to seek. Take time to be holy, the world rushes on. Spend much time in secret with Jesus in love. Abiding in Jesus, like him thou shalt be. Thy friends in thy conduct, his likeness shall see. Take time to be holy, become in thy soul. Each thought and each morning beneath his control. Thus led by his spirit to fountains of love. Thou soon shall be fitted for service above. Let's turn to number 477. The title of this song is There is a Place of Quiet Rest. 477. There is a place of quiet rest. There is a place of quiet rest. Near to the heart of God, a place where sin cannot molest. Near to the heart of God, O oh, Jesus, blessed Redeemer, sent from the heart of God. Hold us who wait before thee, near to the heart of God. There is a place of comfort sweet, Near to the heart of God, a place where we our Savior meet, near to the heart of God. O oh, Jesus, blessed Redeemer, Sent from the heart of God, hold us who wait before thee, near 
to the heart of God. There is a place of full release near to the heart of God. A place where all is joy and peace, near to the heart of God. O oh, Jesus, blessed Redeemer, sent from the heart of God, Hold us to wait before thee, near to the heart of God. The song that we'll sing to prepare our minds for the Lord's Supper is number 366 by Christ Redeemed. 366 by Christ Redeemed. By Christ redeemed in Christ restored, we keep the supper of the word and show the death of our dear Lord until he his body given in our stead is seen in this memorial bread. And as we drink, we see the blood until he comes. And thus that dark betrayal night With the last advent we unite By one bright chain of loving right Until he comes One of the things that we are instructed to to do on the first day of the week when we meet together for worship is to observe the Lord's Supper. We know that Jesus instituted this Lord's Supper on the night in, he, what, in which he was betrayed when he met with his disciples and he explained to them uh, what his fate would be. And in that explanation, uh, he laid out what we have come to look at is the, the symbols that we need to remember that need to be etched in our memory of what he was to go to go through for mankind that his body would be scourged and he would be nailed to the cross that he would shed his innocent blood that we might have forgiveness of sins all of this transpired so that we can have the hope of eternal life with our lord <coughs> So we, as we gather about the Lord's table, let's do so with solemnity. Let's do so uh, just with uh, the thought in mind that we are remembering the one-time sacrifice that Jesus made for each one of us. Let's pray for the bread. Our God and Heavenly Father, that Jesus was willing to endure the agony of the cross in his physical body we are in awe of. We know that he sacrificed himself one time for all. And as we think of his body hanging there on the cross in excruciating pain, help us to remember that body and uh, the body which he gave for each one of us as we partake of this bread which symbolizes that body. We pray this in his most holy name. Amen.
Let's pray for the fruit of the vine. As we take this fruit of the vine to our lips, help us to remember the innocent blood that was shed for each one of us. Uh, help us to understand that it was life-giving for Jesus as he shed it, and it is life-giving to us as uh, it represents the redemption of our lives, uh, the forgiveness of our sins. Help us as we drink uh, just to remember what Jesus went through and help us to remember that his blood washes away our sins. We pray this in his most holy name. Amen. Having completed the Lord's Supper, we do something else that we are, have been instructed to do through our New Testament, and that is to lay by in store and give back to the Lord. We give back to the Lord because all that we have came from the Lord. But in a practical sense, uh, the church which Jesus established um, is the universal church, but they are divided into local churches. Each local church is in a particular area, and hopefully it has an effect on those people around it. Uh, the monies that we give help the local church uh, to reach out to the poor, to reach out to those that don't know Jesus Christ. And we just pray that uh, those that are stewards of this money will do so in a way that uh, would make uh, our God proud of us. Let's pray over the giving. Our Heavenly Father, as we are instructed to lay by in store on the first day of the week, help us to remember the sacrifice that Jesus made for us, and so that in our giving we would also make a sacrifice as to what we have, so that we can help uh, uh, the church which Jesus established to function the way it should, to bring the lost to you, to Help those that are less fortunate than we are. Bless us in our giving. Help us to do it with a uh, uh, cheerful attitude, knowing that we give you but your own. We pray this in his most holy name. Amen. <laughs> the last song that we will sing is number 845. Eight. 45. The title of this song is uh, Gentle Shepherd. <clears throat> Gentle Shepherd, come and lead us. For we need you to help us find our way. Gentle shepherd, come and feed us. For we need your strength from day to day. There's no other we can turn to who can help us face another day gentle shepherd come and lead us for we need you to help us find our way I hope you were able to participate in the song service. I hope that it had its intended purpose as uh, we raised our voices to our God and that God was praised in that. If you were there this morning, uh, you heard <laughs> that the lesson tonight will be the virtue of gentleness. The virtue of gentleness. 
the scripture that we will use as the basis for this lesson is found in Philippians chapter 4 and verse 5. Our Monday evening class uh, that meets in our home um, has been studying from the book of Philippians, and we did spend some time on uh, uh, this virtue uh, that is the virtue of gentleness. The scripture says, let your gentleness be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. Now, uh, what is the nature of this term gentleness? It's a, it's an interesting terminology. And the difficulty with this terminology can be seen in that different versions of the Bible use different terms for gentleness. One of the terms for gentleness that is used is patience. Another one of the terms is softness. Another, another uh, terminology is the patient mind. And then there is modesty. There is forbearance. The King James Version uses the term moderation. And finally, another term that is used is sweet reasonableness. This, these, I think all of these terms, uh, when they are taken at their face value, let us know what this virtue is really all about. So how do we describe, even though we've given kind of synonymous terms for gentleness, how do we describe gentleness itself? Well, I think this is me, and I, I think the scriptures will back this up, that it describes the, the courtesy and the, and the, I guess the, the graciousness which should characterize Christian behavior. Christian behavior should be characterized by our individual gentleness. It, it indicates some interesting things. To me, one of the things that it indicates is the power of yielding. I think it uh, indicates to us the ability to give way sometime, to give way to the wishes of others. Sometimes we get wrapped up in ourselves and we forget the wishes of others. Gentleness helps us to understand that. Third, the, the poise of soul, which enables one to sacrifice his own, uh, to sacrifice actually his own rights sometimes, not by necessity, but out of generosity and sympathy. It is that going of the extra mile that characterizes our gentleness. And, uh, if you want to do the antonym, it is the opposite of being stubborn or being thoughtless. It was embodied in the man Jesus Christ in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 2, uh, chapter 10 and verse 1. It says, I urge you by the gentleness and meekness of Christ Jesus. Now, what the Apostle Paul was saying was that Jesus was a gentle person and he was a meek person. So, gentleness then is the opposite of being contentious. It is the opposite of rigor. It is the opposite of severity. It embodies, I believe, uh, 
the ability of a man uh, to bear injuries with patience and not demand all that he thinks is rightly due him. For the sake of peace, sometimes it is necessary to forfeit our own individual rights so that we can have peace in our life. A good example where that is shown is in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 1 through 7. And it is applied here. And we note that this willingness to be defrauded is, is, is emphasized by the Apostle Paul here in 1 Corinthians 6, verses 1 through 7. Maybe to get a better grasp on this term, is to understand what it means to display this virtue. Now notice in the scripture, Philippians 4, 5, it says, let your gentleness, let your gentleness. Our gentleness should be on display. And for this reason, um, I would consider this to be a part of maybe uh, what we might call heavenly wisdom, as James describes in James 3.17, that wisdom that comes down from above. So our gentleness is reflected in our wisdom. Our Gentleness is to be known by all men. And perhaps that's the most difficult part of this exhortation. Um, is it easy? Well, not always. However, we can make it easy in our lives by being considerate and kind and gentle toward those around us. And you know what? Here's the hardest part. You know, if we have a good friend and we're literally connected at the hip and our thoughts are their thoughts and, and we are very, very close to one another, it's, it's rather easy. I should say it's easier to be gentle with them. Now, the true mark of gentleness is being gentle to the unkind, to be gentle to the thankless, to be gentle to those that are perverse. Our gentleness is not only to be displayed to those that uh, will reflect it because we look at them as being gentle people also, but those that don't have that characteristic. Why? Because our gentleness is now on display. And so it is a hard task to be gentle to those that uh, just don't always reflect the same principles that we reflect. Finally, what is the reason and the motive for displaying this virtue. Well, if we look at the verse again, Philippians chapter four, verse five, that says, let your gentleness be known to all men. It says, there's, there's an addendum onto this. It says, the Lord is at hand. Now, this may be that the Lord is nearby because the Lord ought to be a part of our life. Or this may refer to our meeting the Lord at our death and at his final coming. Both events are imminent, aren't they? The Lord should be nearby to us. However, we must be of the understanding that 
uh, when we, our lives are ended in this physical body, the Lord will then be at our hand. And interestingly enough, and, and this is backed up by scripture, our Lord is ever watchful. He's aware of, uh, of how we, uh, how we conduct our lives. And he's aware of how we treat others. Remember, the first commandment is to love our God with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our mind, and then to love our brothers as ourselves. We can't love our brothers as ourselves unless we are gentle with them. One day, we will have no answer to this judge. When we are judged, we will be judged reflective of how we lived our lives. And one of those characteristics we will have had to display to be judged the way we would like to be judged is, is that we are gentle toward all. And here's another little intriguing thing that I gave pause to as I put this lesson together. If we are not gentle in our treatment of others, do we expect the Lord to be gentle in his treatment of us? That's something for us to chew on for a little while before we even digest it. If we are not gentle in our treatment for other to others, how would we expect the Lord to be gentle in his treatment of us? Remember the parable of the unforgiving servant in Matthew 18, 21 to 35, who was forgiven his debt. And then he went, went around and squeezed money out of someone who was in less debt than he was. This was the unforgiving servant. The Lord treated him gently, and he did not go out and treat someone who owed him gently. In his epistle, James has a warning for us. He said, judgment will be merciless to the one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. If we want the Lord to be merciful to us, it is only reflective of the mercy and the gentleness with which we treated each other. And so as we close this lesson this evening, the display, I believe, of this virtue carries with it great advantages. It can contribute to uh, the comfort of life and the peace in society that reduces friction to people. Instead of lashing out at people, we should be gentle with them. Uh, the writer of the book of Proverbs uh, reflects this in Proverbs chapter 15 and verse 1, where he says, A gentle answer turns away wrath. A harsh word stirs up anguish. And you know, we can promote the gospel of Jesus Christ by demonstrating our virtue of gentleness in our life. I believe it to be an integral part of the gospel message. And so as we end this lesson, we might ask ourselves this very poignant question. Are we gentle people? And the answer, I believe, is wrapped up within itself because Paul lets us know that the Lord is at hand all the time. 
And as we understand that the Lord is at hand, we then ask ourselves the question, are we living a life that's pleasing to him? That starts with us being his children. That starts with accepting the Lord as our one personal Savior, the Son of God. We do this through obeying the great plan of salvation, of after having heard and believed the truth of the word of God, we will repent of our uh, former lives, confess Jesus as God's son, and be baptized for the remission of our sins. If you had that need this evening, we offer that invitation to you. If you need to call one of us and we will be there for you. Thank you for uh, listening to this lesson. Let's close with a prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we, we are called upon, uh, in some of the lists that, uh, Paul has enumerated, for example, in the fruit of the spirit in Galatians five, uh, the list that he also mentions in Philippians four, uh, six and seven, uh, and also in Peter's, uh, list of virtues in second Peter chapter one. We are, we are called upon as Christians, to have these virtues within us. The one that we looked at this evening was the virtue of gentleness, showing kindness to those around us, displaying our Christianity through this virtue of gentleness, because Jesus was indeed uh, gentle and meek. Bless us in our lives to embody uh, what Christ was when he lived on this earth, to have that Christ-like spirit within us. Help us as we reflect upon what Jesus did for us and that he died that we might live, that he was born again, that we might also be born again. Be with us this evening. Help us to look forward to the next time that we meet again together. Comfort us, bless us. I pray this in his most holy name. Amen. Please be safe and may God bless you all. Uh.